Fiora. And welcome to the seventh episode in a series of short videos on the essence of regulation. In the previous episode, we have explored how regulatory tools and strategies can be mixed to develop tailored responses to a wide variety of compliance motivations and behavior of those targeted by regulation. In this episode, we will look at risk as an organizing principle of regulatory governance and regulatory practice. Around the world, governments have embraced risk, risk management, and risk science as a means to allocate their regulatory resources and to make regulation more effective, more efficient, and sometimes even more transparent and accountable. But what exactly is risk? Now, here are a few definitions from the literature. While these and other definitions of risk differ in their details, they all consider risk as a conjunction of the chance, likelihood or probability of something to happen and the strength or weight of the negative or positive impact of that something when it happens. Thinking about risk in these terms, that is, risk as a situation that we can to some extent calculate and predict, is a relatively recent development that has made a transition from the private sector to the public sector. Thinking in terms of risk as an approach to regulation and governance has been gaining popularity in the wake of what seems to be an ongoing trend of ever larger crises around the world. A typical approach for governments to do the doing of risk regulation is to reflect on where their major risks are and allocate their regulatory resources accordingly. Now, there is great merit in identifying where the major risks of a regulator are and controlling them accordingly. But there are risks to this process as well. All too quickly, this process can become a techno-mathematical endeavor where getting the numbers right defies the purpose of the exercise altogether. Also, the data that regulators have at their disposal is sometimes fuzzy, often incomplete or dated. So a matrix like this may then give the illusion of control that doesn't really reflect reality. Also, there is a risk of letting other important areas slip. Over time, low likelihood but high impact risk or high likelihood but low impact risk may change. And that is all the more likely if they are not getting sufficient attention from regulators. So personally, I think that the real value of these kinds of risk matrices is that they can be the starting point for a regulatory discussion and ask, are we getting it roughly right? Within regulatory agencies, they may help discussions between frontline workers and managers and Intel staff. They may also help discussions between regulators and their targets, between regulators and policymakers. These risk matrices may also help to explain clearly to the public at large why resources were allocated to some risks, but not others. It helps increasing the transparency and accountability of how you allocate your resources. But more is required. Ideally, regulators make risk thinking part of a process of ongoing regulatory improvement. The risk governance framework of the International Risk Governance Council can help guiding this process. It proposes a process of ongoing steps to map, explore, manage and mitigate risks. The broad steps are map your risk landscape to get a broad understanding of the types of risks you are dealing with and then carry out a more detailed identification of the risks but also of the concerns of those risks. Keep in mind, besides technical risks, regulators will have to deal with societal risks, political risks and reputational risks. Also, what may look like a risk to the regulator might not look like a risk to a policymaker or a target of regulation, and vice versa. In a next step, 
a more detailed assessment is carried out. Are we dealing with simple or complex risks? Are we dealing with acceptable or unacceptable risks? From there on, the challenge is to develop suitable responses to the risks identified. We have already discussed how to approach that in the earlier episodes in this series. Now, ideally, the management of risks can eventually be completed, simply because the risk is reduced or completely terminated. But even if the risk is ongoing, it is important to periodically carry out a performance assessment, which could be the starting point of the cycle. And then, of course, last but not least, keep asking questions about who to involve and at what stage and why, what to look for and when and where, and make sure that stakeholders maintain involved throughout this process. Now, of course, this is a very idealized version of applying risk thinking in regulatory governance and practice. It is important to keep in mind that, as so often in regulatory governance and practice, there is no one-size-fits-all solution. Keep in mind also that the idea of risk as something that can be commodified and managed comes from the private sector. Many of the risk management tools that are applied in the private sector and have made their way into regulatory governance and practice were simply not developed to deal with the complexity faced by regulators. Luckily, as we have seen in this episode, regulators have a world of knowledge to fall back on when developing their own risk regulation processes. Na mihi, and I hope to see you again soon.